good afternoon. Uh, we have a special edition of the Max Podcast today. As you'll see, um, Steve Shaber is uh, transformed into Pete Meyer. Um, but Pete Meyer is, is here with us today, and uh, we want to thank you for, for being here. Uh, if you don't know Pete, uh, how could you not know Pete? Uh, Pete has a long history in the automotive industry, and uh, Pete currently uh, works for the training portion of Dorman. And so let's welcome Pete Meyer. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate the invite. And uh, it was, it was great to finally get a chance to come visit Max. Uh, yeah. I think we were talking about when I got here. I, I didn't realize it, but uh, your next event will be 18 years. 18 with, years. With uh, my involvement with Max. What, what yeah, and I've, I've probably known you for, for 15 of those or something yeah, long, like that. Yeah, a long time. From my old, uh, my old <laughs> one. So what is it, uh, what's your official title at Dorman? My Official title is training manager with a focus on the digital side of things. Gotcha. Yeah, social media, video, and of course, uh, uh, being part of the training team that goes out and provides mm -hmm. in-person training. But yeah, so that's the official thing is the digital thing in reality, at least from what I've seen, you've done a wonderful job with that because I see you everywhere on Facebook. But unfortunately, I see you everywhere on Facebook in front of a class of automotive technicians in some strange city in some strange part of the, the country. Yeah, well, and that's one of the things that really attracted me to this opportunity. Uh, I've, I've always, and I don't want to sound immodest, but I've always tried in my role with Motor Age uh, to, to see what could I do that day to help make their lives easier, more productive, help them make a better living for themselves and their families. Sure. And and we reached a lot of people that way, still do. Right. But uh, now I have an opportunity to reach those who didn't know those resources existed and to provide them uh, with a, a high quality training level, just like all of the training team does with Dorman, right. uh, which kind of sets us, I think, apart from uh, other alternatives. Yeah. For them. Before we dive back into to Dorman, I just I, I want to rewind the clock. Let's go back. Uh, Pete Meyer's 18, 20 years old. What's Pete Meyer doing? Oh, <laughs> you want to talk about that? Might be too too uh, rated. We for we, we for can edit content. this if we need to, but but um, um, uh, I was I was pretty much uh, just going whatever direction. You know, I was I was living for the party. Okay. You know, that back in those right. days. It was. Uh, it wasn't until I actually met my my wife and had my first child that uh, turned my life around. Okay, and then honest. and and, and so then let's pick it up there. You do you start in the automotive industry at that point, or were you doing something else? Oh, actually, it's kind of interesting. It's like I I've actually been in the automotive industry in one way or another since I was fifteen. Okay, um, I started as a part time job in high school with the, the local full service. Service station. Okay. That, um, probably a lot of people listening won't remember. Right. Uh, guess where you got your oil change? That was the local shop that took care of your car for you and your family. And sure. I was the I was the guy with the star. I was the the big bright Texaco, Texaco star. Guy. Nice. Right. So that, that was where I got my start in the, in the business. Right. Now you know you know we we have a, a friend down in uh, Fort Myers, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Lures and in, in AVI, and and I always remember the stories about. I guess his dad owns some service stations on Sanibel Island or one of those islands there. And it makes me think of that, of that yeah. those days when it was really a service station. It wasn't a chain. It was, you know, it was kind of a chain for gasoline. You know, you yeah. had your brand, right. whatever right. it was. But you were an independent automotive repair with one or two bays and one or two guys. Yeah. And um, you'd have customers. I remember my grandfather had an account with uh, the local gas station repair shop and he would go and he would you know they would pump his gas for him and he would drive away and he never paid him yeah. and they sent him a bill at the end of the month and he yeah. paid the bill and and so forth and um and the kind of folks that you could call and say I, there's something there's smoke or something coming out of my radiator and i know it's eight o'clock on a saturday night but but what do i do and they they said well we'll send somebody over yeah, I mean, and, that was when communities were, you know, more community than they are today, right? Sure, sure. Uh, like yeah. you said, before social big media. Change. Yes, before social media. Before social um, media. There was um, um, just more community involvement then. There, there wasn't all the, the big box chains that we have now. Right. So so you were doing that. So you're in your, your, your teens, your late teens and so forth, and, and you're doing there. And then eventually you get married and... 
you have your first child, and, and, and so where do we go from there? Um, well, um, I went to college for a year, and I really wasn't intrigued by it. Um, I, I, uh, I, the college I went to was in a uh, downtown setting, okay. so parking wasn't the easiest thing to do, right? So I figured, well, I'm going to get a motorcycle, and I, easier to park, right? Well, that was a mistake because I just kind of fell in love with motorcycles and, <laughs> and ended up going to a school in Florida to learn how to work on the, That's actually the first mechanic job I had. Okay. was on two wheels. Uh, and that's how I met my wife was okay. in the motorcycle days, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, when we had our, our first child, of course, uh, you know, the sense of responsibility kind of kicks in and, and you look, you're looking down a little further down the road than maybe you used to. Right, um, and we ended up moving the family to Florida uh, to take advantage of an opportunity. Where were uh, you before? Uh, Richmond, Richmond, in Virginia. Virginia. Okay, yeah, and um, so we took the family to Florida, and um, I spent still some time in the motorcycle business. But then an opportunity came to get uh, in automotive, mm -hmm. and I've been there ever since. Okay, right. yeah. and then, kind of, <laughs> I guess where I first met you was you were in the. Um, I, oh, the magazine business in you know the automotive, whether it's Motor Age or you know I don't know the the, the names changed along the way, but but um, what led you there? That was almost I just dumb luck. Yeah. Um, to be quite honest, I mean uh, um, I had a Lexus with an EVAP issue mm -hmm. uh, when I was working full time in the shop, and and I was it was busting my chops. Mm -hmm. So this is about early year, early years of the internet, right? So I'm going to get on there and do a little digging and see what I can find out. And I would, took a bunch of notes and um, said, I'm just going to put that in my toolbox. That's be my reference down the road. Right. Um, got the car fixed. And um, my wife said, why don't you send that to some one of those magazines you're always reading? Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Why not? Sure. So I did. Uh, it was actually picked up by another publication, but... Um, Motor Age um, liked it. Uh, they just didn't have any place to put it at the time. Mm -hmm. So I started doing some uh, freelance work for them mm -hmm. under uh, Jacques Gordon. Okay. Uh, friend we, had, we both know, right? Sure, sure. And, Jacques uh, actually local, locally or what, used to work for Max years ago. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at Steve. You can't see that. I'm looking at Steve. <laughs> but Jacques and I have known each other forever. Uh, he yeah. used to work for Max and um, um, local here to the Philadelphia area. Yeah. And... Um, um, then a lot of things, just over time, uh, the opportunity came to uh, get on with the magazine full-time as their technical editor. Mm -hmm. And uh, naturally, I said, well, let's see, do I want to keep wrenching and, or do I want to take an easy job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I thought at the time it was going to be an easy sure, job. Sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, they started with the magazine full-time. And right. then until June this past year, I served in that role. Right. And uh, right. now I'm... Over here. So you're you. you um, I think you subscribe to a similar theory that I do, which is you know it's important to know stuff, but it's important to know people, because you know people will help you to get from one place to another. Staying at that place or advancing in that place really is what you know, not who you know. Mm -hmm. But the the opportunities are the networking part and and you know how you how you generate communication and how you generate um, colleagues and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's my shameless plug for come network with us at Max 2024 in Orlando. We're going to shameless plug that again here shortly. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you're at Motor Age and then um, <clears throat> you make a decision to kind of, kind of take a different opportunity, a different path still on the training side and you go work for, what amounts to, I'll call it a private company, I don't know that it's a private company, but, but Dorman, a manufacturer, well-known manufacturer, sells everything you can imagine. I don't know how many SKUs, but tens of thousands of SKUs, I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. Um, I know I have some Dorman um, wind-up, had some Dorman wind-up, uh, win window wind-up things from a 1999 Chevy Blazer that I used to own which I subsequently sold to our friend, Tim Izzy. Mm. Um, and they, they, they had the Dorman label on them. And so I, I know that they make all kinds of replacement parts for, for old stuff. They make yeah. you know, all stuff for modern cars and, and whatnot. And they've kind of started this whole training thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess um, part of that relationship might have started back with Jerry Trulia 
because yeah. I know G was doing some work for Dorman, some training things sponsored by Dorman, and they've, they seem to have kind of grasped that into their own training program. And, and so that's you know, where, where we find you now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And um, like I said, it's, it's the same mission uh, to try to help these men and women, um, but being able to reach those that I wasn't able to reach in my former role. Right. And, right. and to be quite honest, I I'm, 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 will be the first to admit I'm on the sunset side of my career. Ah, and, we, uh, no, we never look. See, I said yeah. the same thing years ago. We don't look at it that way. What we look at is we're, that our, our learning is reducing and our teaching is growing so that we can leave it for the next generation to, to yeah, be able absolutely. to take with them. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I like what you said earlier about the networking because I have to tell you that, and I don't know if you remember this or knew about this, but I was actually the, the first Max AC Technician of the Year. I did not that was, know that. That was 2006. Okay. Right. So my first event was the 2007 conference. Okay. I did um, not know that. I, I knew that Tom Massey was AC Technician of the Year because I was one of the judges for that. We're actually down in Charlotte, uh -huh. North Carolina for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was not aware that you were the first. Well, congratulations. Yeah, that was, there and, should be a monument to you outside or a <laughs> statue or something. Well, that's how I got to go to the conference, and, and I met so many people right. that uh, later became not only friends like, like yourself, yeah. but also great resources to help me do what I wanted to do for the men and right. women of our industry. Right. One of the things that I love about, I love about this industry um, and there's some things I don't like. We're not going to talk about those, but in general, I mean, there's some things I don't like. But, but one of the things that I really do like is you meet somebody, you kind of develop a little relationship with them, and then you have the ability to pick up a phone or send an email and say, I have a question for you, and you, know, and you get an answer. Mm -hmm. Or you get a reference to who might be able to provide the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's so helpful. Um, you know, you, you don't have to, to know it all, but yeah. you have to know who might know it or who might know who knows it. Yeah. And, and that works. We were talking out back earlier about how we teach classes and how uh, we all try to learn something at every class we teach. And, of course, we try to teach a bunch of stuff, too. <laughs> and that that's a great question. I don't know is an acceptable answer. As yeah. long as you follow it with, but I think I might know somebody who knows and if we can exchange information, I will reach out to them and I will see if I can get you the proper answer before I just make something up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of the latter is still occurring yeah. in, in the information that's being provided to these men and women. You know, what's that old saying? If you can't dazzle them with brilliance and baffle them with BS. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Uh, and that's, that should not be in a training environment. That's right. Um, and one of the things I worked is very hard on was to make sure that the content coming through the magazine was accurate. None, none of the myths, none, none of the uh, misinformation that's right. been passed over the generations, but you know, accurate and current. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that I stress now with, with the technicians that I meet in our, in our training programs, you know, is that, that the vehicles they're working on are, are the most complex, highly technical marvels of engineering that the manufacturers have ever produced. Yeah. Uh, th there is no margin for error on these vehicles. You either fix it correctly or you didn't fix it correctly. And yep. the only way you're going to know is by researching and following up the information. Sure. Um, I also share with, with guys who have some time in the industry that, that your experience is, is valid and valuable, but not always. Yeah. You, know, you, you can't rely on what you knew today to apply to the technologies that are coming out today and tomorrow. Right. You know, you, you have to, even something simple like, you know, who thought we would have to tell the, the car that we changed the battery? Yeah. You know, and, and I meet, unfortunately, I meet technicians still that are not aware of that. Right. Um, uh, or don't think about little things like that. Yeah. Or reprogramming a sensor after installing it. Just little things like that. Sure, sure. Um, so that's critical. And like you said, if, if there's a question that arises, I want to be able to provide them with an accurate current answer. Right. Uh, like, for example, I, I took advantage of Steve's uh, uh, expertise uh, after teaching an air conditioning class and having a question uh, about it, the, the IHX and if there was a leak between the inner and outer tube. Um, he didn't know, but he clued me into an engineer that did, uh, and we got that person you know, an accurate, complete answer. Now right. if it comes up in class, 
Now you I don't know, know what to tell them. And, right. and then more recently, I find out I found out what the B is on the Prius shifter. On the, on I'll be shifter, able to right. answer that question. Right. Does that stand for BS as around. well, too? No, no, no. no? Okay. If you want to um, know, you have to go to the, to the face dormant training Facebook. That's page right. And, right. And shameless it's all plug. There. That's all shameless good. Plug. Right? Shameless right. plug. Right. Go to Dorman Training's <laughs> Facebook page, and and you'll find it. You'll find, find it there. Um, um, we talk a lot about uh, training. You guys are doing training and so forth, and getting information. Um, one of our <laughs> topics down at Max 2024 in Orlando, uh, at the Rosen Center, January 31st to February 3rd, shameless plug. Um, but on Saturday, we're going to have Carm Capriato. You know Carm. Mm -hmm. You know Carm very well. I know Carm very well. Carm, uh, host of Remarkable Results podcast and, and yep. a whole bunch of other things. Yep. Um, he's going to host a town hall for us. And the focus of that town hall, we're going to have Ted Hughes from Auto Care with us, formerly of Mala, our, our good friend Ted Hughes, who, by the way, if you didn't know this, Ted first joined Mala. He came to his first Max event because he was, you know, doing the air conditioning thing over with Mala with Eric Schultz and, and those guys. Comes to his first Max event and I was, I think I was on the board on, at the time, I don't quite remember, but what I do know is that one of the staff members from Max said, hey, we need you to play golf with this new guy from Mala, Ted Hughes, because we really don't know him and we just want somebody who's not going to lose their mind. Because we had some people who were, were golfers back then Paul Verdile, um, who, <laughs> who were known for, you know, having a bad shot and throwing a club or whatever the case <laughs> was. So that was my first introduction to, to Ted Hughes. But Ted is going to be with us, um, and he's going to talk all about Auto Care Association and specifically uh, the right to repair and the big, big drive that they have. Um, uh, I'm a little more distant from the right to repair than, than some other folks, folks who are, who are more in tuned with a lot of the diagnostics like yourself. But my take on it is this, is that there's an instruction book or there's, there's tips and tricks and tools and so forth. And if the car makers who've invested millions and billions of dollars developing this intellectual property and technology and so forth, and they want to protect it. But at the end of the day, the public has the right to have their vehicle serviced where they want to have it serviced. Yeah. Not outside of warranty. I'm not talking about in warranty. Correct. Outside yes. of warranty. And you can't do that without having access to the information. So there's this balance between rewarding the car manufacturers through financial remuneration, um, reasonable financial remuneration, for access to the information required to repairing the car. Yeah. And, um, and as technology gets, gets further and further along, whether it's, it's you know, Tesla or new EVs that are coming out and so forth, um, it's important to maybe have some legislation that kind of guarantees that access at a fair and reasonable price. Am I, am I wrong, or, or is, that, is that really where we are? Um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Of course, you probably remember when Right to Repair was, was first brought up in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, that was about 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. Um, when OBD2 came out, um, the, the automakers had to allow us access that had anything to do with the mill light or emissions. Um, so it was the tooling, the information, to right. be able to pre-program all of that. Uh, but they didn't have to give us anything else. Gotcha. Um, and what I tell guys now is that, that even so, when the right to repair bill was, was introduced in, in, in Massachusetts, a lot of the OEMs didn't want to see that pop up in the other 49 states. Uh, so they signed that letter of understanding or memorandum of understanding mm -hmm. with ACA, other industry organizations at the time. That pretty much said, if you don't pursue this as official legislation, we'll play nice. Right. And and gave us a lot of the other stuff that we were they were asking for. Right. All in the name of being able to give the consumer the choice. Right. Right. Where right. they were paired. Um, but then came along things like the secure gateway module. Right. With Chrysler, right. Right. which pretty much prevented you from asking the computer to do anything, whether it was a bi-directional control. Or clear code, right? You know, you couldn't even clear the, the codes, right? So the, that uh, um, 
that was the start. And other manufacturers are certainly doing the same thing. Yeah. So now it's all come to the forefront again. Right. A um, lot, of, lot of noise with the right to repair, um, you know, in Massachusetts again, but what, the one you're referring to is the Repair Act. Um, it's still in, in, in the works yeah. um, and needs us to be vocal about what we want, you know. Right. Uh, right. I'm a big believer in it because, like you said, this is a standard that will apply to all 50 states and all manufacturers. Right. Uh, I've got to give props to um, NASTIF, National Automotive Service Task Force, Donnie. for the work that they've yep. done, Donnie Seifer and, and yep. his team, um, by keeping doors open, uh, doing everything they can to make sure the information is flowing. Right. Um, some manufacturers, not so, you know, not so much. Uh, others, like for example, I consider Toyota probably one of the most helpful right. to the aftermarket. Right. Um, and to see companies like Tesla and Polaris now joining that and allowing access to some of their information, mm -hmm. and they really don't have to, right. you know, for any reason. So right. that right. that's a plus, and I, hopefully <coughs> that'll uh, that'll come to fruition. I I know I. I'm in favor of it, and I encourage anyone listening who's in the industry, if you're making your living servicing these automobiles, right. uh, you you need to do your homework and then decide where you stand. And and, yeah. and it goes beyond the, the service technicians. It goes mm -hmm. to um, people who make parts like Dorman, because mm -hmm. the reality is if, <clears throat> if that technician or that shop doesn't have access to the information to repair the car, they won't know what part to buy. And if they don't know what part to buy, that's going to go to the dealer. Right. And then that affects Dorman. And, and someone like Dorman, again, I'm not picking on Dorman at, at all. We're just, we have Pete here. So, but, you know, some of these OE parts, um, they get made obsolete. Um, some of them are incredibly expensive, lately been very hard to find. Yeah. And there's alternatives to those parts, but we need to know what those parts are. And, and the right. right to repair really impacts all of that. It impacts sure. equipment manufacturers. And, tool, scan and tool, tool diagnostic scan tool tools. diagnostics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always look back at, uh, when I talk right to repair, I, I look back um, to Gone in 60 Seconds, the movie, one of my favorite movies, uh, Gone in 60 Seconds. And you recognize that, that the OEs have, have some valid concerns mm, absolutely. about security, particularly security. And that's a lot where Donnie has come in and, you know, they've, they've got some, some certification things. They want background checks for certain things. And, and I think that's important because it's, I don't want the wrong person getting a hold of some kind of security, cut a key type code information, you know, disable yep. things through the, the pushing the buttons on the radio and, and whatnot. Um, but there has to be a balance. Yes. And, and the idea is to make sure that we can get a long-lasting balance uh, yep. between the vehicle manufacturers, the, manufac uh, the, the tier one kind of, tier two kind of manufacturers, the distributors, the service shops, and yep. the technicians. And another topic has kind of come up in the same vein, and I, and I don't know how, if we want to be brutally honest um, you know, with, with those who are listening. Um, there's 750,000 men and women in the automotive repair sector alone. Mm -hmm. That kind of collision or heavy duty or any of those markets. Right. Um, and it'd be, it'd be my, my personal opinion is that a lot of the manufacturers are also hesitant to release information to people they feel are not qualified to work on these very complex vehicles. Right. Um, again, this is not your daddy's Oldsmobile. These are very complex pieces of equipment and I can see where they'd be worried about someone playing with their software, altering mm -hmm. safety systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we talk a lot about ADAS, for example, mm -hmm. and how a lot of routine service work will impact how these systems function, and these technicians aren't aware of that. They're right. sending these vehicles out where maybe that won't function as designed, and the manufacturers know the first name on the lawsuit's gonna be theirs. Exactly. You know, so th that's a big part of it as well, I'm sure. Sure. Um, I don't. I don't. I know what I would like to see as, as a potential solution, but I probably won't be in the in the majority <laughs> of that. But uh, that's certainly something they have to consider, and I understand you know where that angle comes from. That's right. why we push the need and, and preach all the time the need for continuing education. It's no right. longer something that's nice to have. You, if if you're in this industry, it's a must have. You have to have it. Yeah, yeah. You have to have it. And I and I think that there are solutions that we we can come up with. You certainly have to understand. 
their perspective, like you said, that they'll be at the top of that paper, uh, the legal paper from the lawyer. Um, but also you'll end up with potentially that's aftermarket repair shop, um, frankly, maybe not being qualified to do it, not because the information is not available, but they haven't gotten the right training or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're communicating the kid and the customer, we did everything right, the problem is the car. Yes. Yes. And now the consumer yes. has an issue with the people who made the car. Yeah. And really the people who made the car were like, no, you took it to somebody to service it and they really weren't qualified. We allowed them to have the information. They didn't have the training they needed. They kind of pretended to do it and when they came up short, they blamed it back on the car and now you're blaming the car. But at the end of the day, it has to be a partnership between the aftermarket, all of the aftermarket, people have to be willing to get the training they need. Manufacturers have, been, have to be willing to provide the information to those who are qualified or you know, some kind of release there. Um, and be compensated in some way, shape, or form for that information in a reasonable sure. basis through yes. a subscription model or whatever the case might be. Sure. Um, you know, because they have to protect that investment. Sure. So, but we look forward to having a town hall with uh, Ted Hughes, uh, Carm Capriato, and we'll see who else we can drag on stage there. Well, <laughs> we're there. Um, on Saturday. Um, February, February 3rd, February 3rd, I think. February 3rd, yeah, at the Rosen in Orlando. Pete, I want to talk about one more thing before we wrap up. Sure. Uh, first of all, I appreciate your time. You mentioned motorcycles. Yes. You have a passion for motorcycles. I do. You have a, um, a favorite charity related to motorcycles. Uh, we do, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, my wife and I actually founded a small nonprofit called Bikers Care. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to stamp out child abuse mm -hmm. in all its way, shape, and form. Mm -hmm. uh, we try that uh, mainly through education, uh, making people aware uh, what to look for, mm -hmm. see something, say something, mm -hmm. you know, message. Um, and we also have a couple of fundraisers during the course of the year. One we're, we're just closing out. Um, the one in the fall is for uh, area domestic violence shelters near us. Mm -hmm. um, we call it the No Child Forgotten. Uh, fundraiser mm -hmm. um, because at Christmas time everybody has something for kids. Toys for Tots, of course, top of the line. You know that's the major charity, mm -hmm. but everybody has something like that going on for kids. Right. Um, these typically do very well for kids who are in foster care or in the hospital or other circumstances. But the kids who are staying in the shelters are kind of off the radar. Right. Uh, so we don't want them to be forgotten. Right. You know. So we we do that. Um, we had a modicum of success with this year. I um, uh, thought we would like to do better, but hey, we'll take what we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other one's coming up in April. That is our uh, efforts to help the child advocacy centers in the same counties. These are the centers that help kids who have been sexually abused. This right. is where the police take the victim. This is where they're, they are given their physical or forensic investigation. Yeah. But more importantly, this is where they get the counseling and support they need to get on the road to recovery. And, and all of it, at least in our area, all of it is provided to the families at no charge. Right. So anything that we can do to assist them, we do. Right. Um, and when we hold these events, it's, it's not just about raising the funds. The, the agencies actually come out with us so that they can uh, be in the public eye. They can answer questions from the uh, people mm -hmm. who attend. And, you know, I, it's like I tell them every year, you never, never know when someone's gonna grab you by the elbow and pull you to the side and say, I need your help. Right. Right. So that's right. Right. I know yeah. I know somebody who knows somebody who has a situation and can you help me? Yeah. And yeah. So um bikerscare.org, Stephen? Pull yeah, it's, up. it's bikers dash care dot org. Yeah. And of course you can type bikers care into Google and we're pretty easy to find. I think uh, we should show up there pretty. There we go. There we go. And, so, I, and uh, I love that. Can you scroll? Because I want to release. I would love to share that. That's one of my favorite images. There's old, um, old Albert in his biker best. But I love what he said. Uh, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. Sure. And, and that's really the message we try 
to say these children are being hurt typically by the people who are most responsible for taking care of them and loving them and protecting them. Right. So if that's not happening, who's going to do it? Right. Not but us. Right. So I, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a very noble cause, and um, you know, we all would like to to make that end forever. But if we can't make it for end forever, at least we can do something to mitigate the effects of it moving sure. forward. Absolutely. And and that's an important thing. Um, we never got to uh, the Dorman Training website. Uh, Steve's going to pop that up here for, for a moment, uh, <laughs> but you know we had so much time. So Dorman, Dorman Training Live is uh, where you can find more information on Dorman's uh, live training around the yeah. country, various different trainers, high quality stuff. Yeah, building uh, a lot of resources there as well. Yeah, uh, and, and, and lots of different topics yes. too. It's not really just about products Dorman sells. Oh, not, no, not it's, in the least. It's about, you know, um, educating and yeah. partnering with people yeah. like I'll, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on air or not, but you know people like O'Reilly, which which you did a lot of work with um, there to um, you know to, ha- to have them participate with you to get you guys in front of auto technicians. Yeah, and I, and I really want to stress that point because the, they have a separate group that that does the product end of it. Yeah, none at none of our training events do we. Do any type of commercial or, or no? If, if it wasn't for the name on our shirts, you wouldn't really know that we, we were know. from Dorman. Right. Um, right. Th- they've been really supportive and and, and Mr. Trulia's efforts to to build a uh, word stop, class. Stop! 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 Mister. Yeah. Well, Mister. G. G. <laughs> it's guy G. We all know. Right. Right. But uh, yeah. to, in his efforts to to build a a, a world class training resource for for men and women in the business. And that's what we're working to on the website. Yeah. You'll find a lot of videos that you can access for free. Yeah. Uh, we do have some uh, recorded webinars that if you could make the live event with us, and you know, you can get that for a small, small fee. But yeah. uh, and more coming, a yeah. lot more coming, in 2024. Yeah. Well, we're, we're pleased to have uh, Pete Meyer with us here today. We're going to have Pete Meyer with us down in Orlando. He's going to be teaching for us. Yeah. Jerry Truly will also be down there teaching for us. And, uh, and a whole bunch of others, you know, all, all, all the names that you know. Uh, can't wait to have you down there. Um, Pete, it's been a pleasure having you here with us. Yeah, I appreciate it's Max it. and Lansdale. Uh, always good to chat. We're going to go get some, uh, some dinner and maybe a cocktail. We'll see. Okay. Uh, but uh, thank you for coming in. Oh, my um, pleasure. So for, I'm Peter Call for Max and... I'm Pete Meyer with Dorman Training. Thank you for being here. Cheers. Cheers. This podcast is a production of Max, the Mobile Air Climate Systems Association. Max is the nonprofit trade association for the mobile air conditioning industry, representing manufacturers, tier one suppliers, tool and equipment providers, parts distributors, and of course, service shops, owners, and technicians. Max is a membership driven organization serving the industry through training, education, advocacy, government relations, standards writing, and EPA Section 609 certification. If you'd like to learn more about Max, please visit us on our website, www.maxmobileairclimate.org, where you can join Max as a member. This podcast was produced by me, Steve Schaber, and hosted by Peter Call. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give a thumbs up and please subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Thanks for listening.